This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. It is my pleasure to welcome Scott Shea to the show. He is the author of a new book entitled Conspiracy You, a case study. He's also co-founder and chairman of Signature Bank, and it's great to have him on. Scott, welcome. Today is a big day for you, isn't it? Yeah, Jason, it's the first day that we're trading. Signature Bank is on the S&P 500. Congratulations. Wow, that's that's a big deal. I'm surprised you're here for this interview. I'm honored. <laughs> Jason, for you, of course. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. Well, hey, let's talk a little bit about banking first, if we can. You know, you've written about this possibility of a cashless society. Well, I don't know that it's really a possibility. I think it's just what we can expect in the future. I remember taking my mastermind group to Sweden about well, maybe two years ago and signs everywhere in stores, no cash accepted. You know, they don't want to deal in cash. And, and I know we're moving in this direction, but it really does concern me because people will lose their spending privacy. And that's a big form of privacy, how you vote with your money, right? Right. Well, I actually wrote an article. I started thinking about this back in 2013. I wrote an article which actually ended up being, I uh, went viral, called The Cashless Society, A Major Threat to Our Civil Liberties. Yep. Because I didn't have the vocabulary at the time, so even reading it now, it seems a little dated. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing about a, a central bank digital currencies. And here's why most Chinese folks who have been offered the uh, digital yuan haven't taken it, even though it's free money. It's because once the government can track every single transaction that you are making, you lose all privacy. So for example, a few years ago here in New York, Mayor Bloomberg, more than a few years ago, I guess, 10 years ago, went on a campaign against sugary drinks above 16 ounces. I remember I that. I them. Well, if you wanted to, you could, if you had a CBDC, you could say, well, no more money won't work for drinks, for yeah. sugary drinks, right. for sugary sodas above um, 16 ounces. Not only that, but in this, in one administration, you could have money not work for donating to the NRA. And yeah. then in the next administration, money doesn't work for donating to Planned Parenthood. Yeah. Or at right. a minimum... The government knows what you're doing. Yeah. And that's a tremendous risk to civil liberty because you could just be shut down and yeah. and die hungry if the government doesn't allow you to transact. I, I, I couldn't agree more if they tie that in with social scoring and whether or not you're wearing a mask or what you're posting on Facebook or who the heck knows. And not only that, and I'm sure you've you know, thought about this and probably written about it too, but they can create inflation or deflation and change the yeah. velocity of money and make money expire. You know, you got to spend it this month because we got to prop up the economy. So it expires at the end of the month. If you don't spend your money, it's gone. I mean, and tying this in with a universal basic income concept is probably what they're planning to do, isn't it? Well, I don't know all of that in all candor, because I think it'll depend on who's in power. But that's what scares me, yeah. is that I don't think it should depend on who's in power in terms of your ability to express yourself personally. Yeah. But there's no question that if we go to a central bank digital currency, all of what you've just said is potentially on the table. Having said that, I don't see any problem with allowing individuals to transact using digital payments, because there, at least the court needs to agree to a subpoena of your records. And it's not so easy as the government just pushing a button or some government employee pushing a button or pushing a set of keystrokes more accurately and banning your purchases or banning you from having certain types of purchases. So that's why I think there's so such risk to the central bank digital currency. And 
That's why I think even in China, people are sort of voting with their pocketbooks not to do that. And that's also why totalitarian regimes like that sort of thing, because yep. we are what we express where the rubber meets the road in terms of personal freedom is how we spend our money. Absolutely. Not can, can, can you imagine uh, not only what you said about NRA and Planned Parenthood, but just not being able to use your money to support a candidate, right? Yeah. You know, you can't make a political donation to, you know, the Trump campaign, but you can make it to the stupid Biden campaign. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Or, by the way, or vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. No, you I know, know it, like, it could know, go both ways. Yeah. Good for the goose and good for the gander. But the problem is, is it'll depend on who's in who's has power. Yeah. And unfortunately, whoever has power that last time may be the last one with power. Right. The, so, the one to, to stay in office for 26 years like Putin, right? <laughs> or something. Yeah. So it's a problem. And yeah. that's why I'm not an advocate of central bank digital currencies. And I think my article, again, it'll sound dated, but it was, unfortunately, it's, it's still accurate in everything it says. Yeah. Does Signature Bank have anything to do with the cryptocurrency world? I mean, are you yeah. doing something? Tell us about that. So we are the leading provider in the United States of infrastructure to the cryptocurrency world. I would go so far as say just about all of the legitimate players, large players in the cryptocurrency world are our clients. Because one thing we saw early was that this was coming down the road. And so we're not a retail bank. We are a business bank. So we decided to try to build an infrastructure they had exchanges, OTC traders, custodians could use as a way to transfer fiat among themselves in a 24 by 7 blockchain environment. So we created our own digital currency called Signet, our own digital 24-hour transfer system. It's on the blockchain, so it's digital native, it's blockchain native. And if you're in Tokyo, Tbilisi, Tel Aviv, Timbuktu, or Toledo, at 3 a.m. on Sunday, wherever that is, wherever that is, you can transfer money. So if you're transferring your Bitcoin at the same speed, you can transfer your money. Mm -hmm. And this is all behind. You have to be institutional. We don't take any retail clients for this, but it's behind a walled garden. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're behind the walled garden and you're a big player, you can transfer, as I said, 24 by 7 as fast as the blockchain refreshes, which since we are in charge of refreshing it in there, in there, it's no longer than 25 seconds. So it takes away credit risk from people. Is that a cryptocurrency tied to your bank balance? It's a signature deposit. Bank? It's a total. So it has no fluctuations because it is a digital representation of a dollar in your deposit account. Got it. It's in a certain kind of way. Think of it as you have a you have a depository account. You could get money from it with a wire. You get money from it with a debit card, writing a check, or this mechanism of a blockchain transfer. And the cool thing is, is that we've announced publicly that we have about $8 billion in Signet. So if it were a, and this is only among institutions that have got, got into the wall guard, if it were actually a stable coin, it would be one of the largest, not mm -hmm. obviously as large as the, the, the two or three biggest, but it would be one of the largest. And the reason people love it is they don't have to worry about it fluctuating and they know they've got a deposit in an FDIC insured bank. They do have to worry about the dollar fluctuating though. <laughs> well, the dollar is a different story. That's why they're buying Bitcoin right, or yeah. Ethereum or Polkadot or sure. whatever they're buying. Yeah, get it. So just out of curiosity, now that you have your own digital currency, do you view Bitcoin, for example, as a competitor? No, Bitcoin is definitely not a competitor. It is a store value. Mm -hmm. We are a payment mechanism. I mean, there have been weekends where days, not even weekends, days where billions of dollars have changed hands. That would be uneconomic if you're uh, using Bitcoin to exchange value. Not only would it be uneconomic, because don't forget you have to pay the miners. Mm -hmm. And the miners extract some amount of money. So you don't actually know ever know exactly what you're sending to the other side in, in stablecoin. Right. There's always a little bit of a discount, minimally gas fees. 
and in Bitcoin, it's whatever is the market is at that time for for um, doing the hashing. So, you know, this really leads into a good question about banking. What is wrong with banking? I mean, I know what's wrong with it. I have my own opinions. So it's a somewhat rhetorical question. But, you know, you're you're a bank founder, very familiar with this and on the cryptocurrency side, too, which is very interesting. So I guess the question would be kind of what's wrong with the banking system we have now? And why do you support breaking up the big banks, which I support as well? So you're referring to my TED talk on breaking up? the Uh, Yes. Okay. Here's the thing. We started this bank to be a disruptor and we've continued to disrupt. I mean, we wouldn't be in business if our competitors didn't create a system that allows us to have grown from zero, uh, no deposits, no clients, no nothing, losing $3 million a month to a hundred plus million dollar bank that's as, you know, joined the S&P 500 today. So that we identified and we continue to identify those issues and, and it become a business bank. Now, I think that it was a serious mistake. And for anybody who wants to watch the, my TED talk, it's a, uh, banking by the people, for the people. I think the United States government made a severe mistake allowing mergers that has resulted in five banks having 60% of market value, 60% of deposits in the United States. I think, I don't know what the market value is, but deposits in the United States, because there's such over-concentration in the banking business that there's less competition. And I think competition is good. I don't like lack of competition, whether it's private because of platforms or public because the government outlaws competition. Chase Manhattan in New York, I'm sorry, JP Morgan Chase, consists of, in the, just in the last X number of years, 19 banks. There used to be JP Morgan, there used to be Chase, there used to be Manny Annie, there used to be Chemical. The, I could go on and on. Yeah. And, and years ago, it was the house of Morgan, right? <laughs> sure. And, and, and so there used to be 19 banks you could go to to try to convince them that they should make a loan to you. Right. There were 19 banks that you could evaluate their loan portfolio and decide you were going to put a deposit there. Now there's one, and there's danger in that. Oh, there's yeah. huge danger in that. We, it's, it's so scary that we're in this kind of like winner-take-all world where these huge companies have just scaled into these behemoths. And certainly I'm referring to tech companies too, which is super scary. <laughs> But why did it happen that way? Is it just that Jamie Dimon had better lobbyists or is it because it's so highly regulated that it's hard for new entrants to come in and play in the sandbox? No, you know, now, so the the regulators got themselves into a conundrum because it used to be, I, for example, I don't think they should have ever repealed Glass, Glass-Steagall yep. Yep. Um, because there was this misapprehension that Canada only has five banks and Europe, there's only a, there's only a few large banks. It somehow was more economically efficient of a few banks. That was wrong. And, you know, you didn't need to approve Bank of America, not Wachovia, Bank of America Nations Bank. You didn't need to approve, you know, Wachovia. You didn't need to approve a lot of these big bank mergers. They was nothing... They weren't at the time. They weren't under distress, although Wachovia at the end was. But the, I think the regulators thought that over that consolidation was good, and from a big regulatory perspective, it is good because there are fewer banks to it's regulate. Easier to regulate, right? It's yeah. not as fragmented for them. Yeah. But from a perspective of of the country, would you trust the, our national security to five? army bases and hope that that was military base. And hope yeah, that right. was five, big. five giant army bases rather than, right. well, we have too many now, but I get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, you get the idea. I mean, yeah. but now they've gone to a certain degree. So the only people that can compete against the big banks have to have some scale. Yeah. You don't have to be a trillion dollar bank, but you have to be, you know, you, if you don't have a, a, you know, $50 million balance sheet, you're not going to be able to compete against JP yeah. Morgan. Right. So we are where we are. And so how did how did Glass Steagall create up. how did Glass Steagall create this though? Where's the connection with Glass Steagall? That's a separate issue. I just want to make okay. clear, make clear. All right. But I think combining the 
I don't want to want to call it casino aspects, but more speculative aspects of the financial markets with with depository insurance was a yeah. mistake. Right. I don't think I don't think the that people who are underwriting and trading for a living should be having depository insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Bankers should be a very conservative bunch and the Wall Street folks should be a different bunch. Right. Yeah. And it helps if they're yeah. aggressive. I'm all for speculation and one. Once in a while, Wall Street firms will have to go bump in the night. Yeah, right. Okay, so maybe let's switch gears unless there's anything else you want to talk about as far as banking. And let's talk about your book a little bit. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about my book. Okay. I mean, so I, your, your new book, Conspiracy U, A Case Study, like Conspiracy University, yeah. and professors are teaching all kinds of garbage out there nowadays. I don't think anybody will disagree with that. The university system has just created like a generation of brainwashed people. But what's going on specifically, if you will, with some of these conspiracy theories that are being taught to young adults? So here's the thing. A lot of people say what you just said, and they have that sense. But what I do in the book is I actually bring that, I wrestle this down I mm-hmm. show where professors and I cite books that they're pu- that are being published by places like Duke University Press, Stanford University Press, other great ins- you know great presses and institutions all over the country where professors are teaching things that you actually have to buy into the conspiracy theory in order to even understand what they're talking about. And they're going to give us some examples. Yeah, let me give you an example. One example from a professor at Northwestern who wrote the hoax of the 20th century, a tenured professor of electrical engineering. And he wrote a book stating that the uh, Holocaust didn't happen. Um, that, and, and here's the thing, and this is the difference between a conspiracy theory and a conspiracy, a conspiracy, a theory about a conspiracy is you can say, okay, there was a lab in uh, the Wuhan virology lab accidentally, your hypothesis could be accidentally or purposely, release COVID-19 to the world. Well, you have to do an investigation and you have to, you can then decide one way or the other, or you may evaluate and say, I don't have enough facts. It's unknown. A conspiracy theory is unfalsifiable because whenever a fact is thrown at it, the theory expands around the facts. So let me, let me just give you Professor Butts's theory about the Holocaust, which is that it didn't happen. There's a problem. There are tens of thousands of documents across Europe depicting the conspiracy theory, the not the, cons- the conspiracy to, to, to destroy and to murder the Jews. There is um, documentation of the Wannsee Conference in 1942, where the final, quote unquote, final solution was determined and a plan for executing it was put into place. There were plenty of Germans after the war who... Um, confess to to murder, confess to right. being guards, perpetrators, etc. So, what does Arthur Butts do? He says, "Well, these this clever cabal of money Jews planted these. They forged these documents and planted them all over Europe. And, and I suppose they they forged all the tattoos on people's arms. All and of so it. Forth don't, too, right? yeah, you don't even guess. What yeah. are you even thinking of? Of yeah. course, they forged it, and they yeah. paid people. Yeah. And not only that." But they, to use his word, bamboozled, innocent, pure, hapless Nazis to confess to crimes against humanity that they would never even think of confessing. Yeah, why, why, why would they confess to something they didn't do and end up, you know, punished well, for it? Because they were bamboozled. Yeah. That's how the theory, according to him, that's how the theory expands around any. And it happened in, with Sandy Hook. It's happened yeah. with QAnon. It happens all over. And what my book shows is it's not just on the far right. I show how it happens exactly the same on the far left. So give us some, like an example of that. I'll give you an example of that. Let's take another example relating to Jews. There's a professor at Northwestern, um, Stephen Thrasher, who thinks that the Israel is sending drones around Gaza to gas people. Oh and God. interestingly enough, uses, you know, sort of that same Holocaust um, imagery. And he does so with no facts and claims that Israel's police is, I'm sorry, Israel, the state is conspiring with police departments all across the world to oppress people of color. 
no facts. I mean, I can go on and on. He is essentially doing exactly what Arthur Butts is doing, which is creating a conspiracy theory. And anytime someone brings something against it, the theory expands. Here is, this is a professor of social justice reporting. He's got a named chair. And yet this is a sort of the bunk. And what I do in the book is to actually wrestle this down and to give, we don't have a lot of time right now, but I give examples and I give suggestions for how we can fix this because if we don't this country is going to end up as to, as warring tribes with each set of each tribe at the other's throat is tenure part of the problem you know i i mean tenure like many things seem to start out as a good idea right it would protect professors so that their career wasn't as at risk if they wanted to assert a new idea, right? Which is the whole concept of getting a PhD, right? Is, you know, you, you bring a, a whole new idea into the world, right? Right. But these professors, some of them are just whack jobs. Well, you know, it's, is, it's it, yeah, it's used to protect. I mean, there's some departments where unless you buy into a conspiracy theory that that department is, is purporting, you can't even, don't even think about applying for a PhD. Don't even think about applying for a job. So the problem is it's used now in a negative way and it's, and it's harming students and it's because they're not being taught how to think they're being taught what to think. And they don't even know how to ask basic analytical questions. Yeah. No critical thinking has, uh, you know, you can just see it all over social media. It's just gone out the door. It has left the building. It's like Elvis critical thinking has left the building. <laughs> Well, that's where my book, look, I don't think it's going to be easy to fix this. I think yeah. actually, if we do nothing, we're in for civil war light in the United States because critical thinking allows us to have a conversation. If we each have our own backs, if you believe that despite everything, no Holocaust took place, well, I can't really have a conversation with you. And it's these these massive amounts of, not ma- they are really massive amounts, these of conspiracy theories that are being peddled as truth that is deeply troubling. And if you even question the theory, that in itself is enough to have you ostracized. Right. Very scary. That's why, that's why I spent all, look, you can tell I have a busy day job. Yep. I spent all of my discretionary free time for 20 months, tracking this down, wrestling this down and, providing a book that can be used by people who are taxpayers and subsidizing this bunk yep. and by donors of universities who are doing way too little and by folks who are just are worried about the future of civil society. So yeah. this is huge to me. Yeah, and I agree. And you know what? This is maybe your next book, but why is it that these universities get all this preferred tax status and social status? These are these are hedge funds. I mean, these companies are, these university endowments are basically hedge funds, you know, where they're, they're, they're out there. They own the town. They own all the real estate in the town. It's uh, they're investors. I mean, what, why do they get special tax treatment? It's insane, but maybe that's, let me ask, let me just say something even more basic. Yeah. The place like Cutter, which donates over $200 million a year to universities in America. Uh-huh. Why are they donating that? Is yeah, right. Question. Northwestern University has received more than a half a billion dollars from Cutter. Mm-hmm. Is it? And you know, you have to wonder what is going on. Yeah. So well, forget about the U.S. tax benefits. We're being out circled and out foxed by foreigners who rightly recognize that it's a long-term strategy uh-huh. is to get at the next generation of leaders in universities. It's basically like lobbyists. You know, they're they're basically lobbying through the universities in a way. But what do you think is going on with Cutter? Don't half a billion dollars, this is incredible that yeah. they're allowed to influence our schools like that. But what do you, what's your speculation on that? I'm curious. I, I that you gotta read the book for. It's a yeah. lot it's it's such a long conversation. All right, good stuff. I gotta well, Scott, leave people there's the gotta gotta get encourage people to buy the book. 
Right, right, absolutely. Okay, so the book is entitled Conspiracy You, A Case Study. It's available in all the usual places. It's got fantastic five-star ratings, by the way. I can't wait to read it myself. And Scott, I know you are a busy man, and especially today, congratulations on getting your bank on the S&P. Anything else you want to say in closing? Give out a website, whatever. Oh, uh, my website, if people want to read about what I say about PPP, LIBOR, other business matters, um, they can go to my website, scottshay.com. Um, and, and, you know, they can, they can uh, learn what I'm thinking about the economy and the like there. So, but it was a great to have this conversation. You really covered the bases and I'm just envious looking out my dreary window and seeing you in Palm Beach. <laughs> well, I'm about to take the dog for a walk. It's a nice sunny day. So come down here and enjoy the no state income taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Scott. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Music.